to basically see that presentation. But for this part, we're focusing on pests and disease and, in, and to include nutrition. All right, so let's commence with the training. All right, so topics we're gonna to focus on today. As you can see, target yield. What you had mentioned last training, and secondly, general information on onions. Thirdly, seed selection, followed by methods of planting, your exceeding versus transplant, developmental stages of onion, onion requirements, pests and diseases, uh, acne nutrition, and our special feature, the Atkin diamonds. And to, and to complete the training, we we'll focus on cost benefit analysis. All right, for the last training, we just gotta mention the target yield that we're aiming for for the year 2020 to 2021 cropping season. And as you can see, we're, we're trying to aim for 45,000 pounds, which we have, we have done it before with the program and we'll, we will achieve it for this upcoming season. So farmers have that aim in mind of 45,000 pounds, and this is per acre, right? Of marketable yield of onion. All right, so basically some general information. Onion allium sepa, uh, also known as the bulb onion, right? And this is one of the mainly cultivated genus or species of the genus allium. Because in within this genus, you have things such as the bunching onions, which are usually called scallions, chive, leeks, garlic, garlic, etc. So onions is basically a widely cultivated species of the genus. Right? And in Jamaica, as you can see, basically we consume about 10 million kg of onion yearly. Right? And this information was got garnered from RADA. And what that is equivalent to about 22 million K, uh, pounds of onion, right? And if I also work that out, that would, and well, based on the target yield of 45,000 pounds per acre, if I also work that out, we need about 490 acres of onion to be, to be cultivated this year to satisfy our local demand. But so far, we're not meeting that demand level. And I can plan, plan to increase that or, or to meet that level by our target yield. All right. And what that, that's been doing is basically uh, hiking up the import bills, which we realize when, when we're out of season, especially in the spring planting, uh, a lot of importation is done within that period and coming later down into the year. All right, so one of the first aspects we need to focus on is basically seed selection. And the several factors we have to look at when we're selecting our seed are the varietal day length. So the day length that that variety or the specific, specific variety can be grown in. Secondly, size, shape, and skin that you're looking for. So you have different markets searching for either white onion, yellow onion, uh, red or purple onion. So you have to basically understand what your market is looking for to, to determine the variety to select. And finally, disease resistance or tolerance. And this is especially key when you're in periods of extreme rainfall or extreme heat. Right? Uh, fungal problems use, usually develop when conditions are at its extreme. And the pathogen is usually present during the year. And when the crop is being grown, you have infiltration of the pathogen. So let us basically focus on each requirement. All right. So as you can see, day length, right? Uh, internationally, internationally Onions are categorized in three categories, right? So you have the short day length, which requires about 12, 10 to 12 hours of daylight, while you have the day neutral onion, which requires about 12 to 14 hours. And then now we have the long day onion. Uh, being in the tropics, we usually have a short day and a day neutral in terms of medium. We don't have long, 
14 to 16 hours of the of daylight, like in the Americas or Europe, right? So our our varietal selection usually is within a short day variety or a day neutral. A lot of times, persons kind of mix up the term day neutral, where they think it's a variety that can be grown straight through the year. But based on international understanding, a day neutral, I'll say 12 to 14 hours of daylight. Right? All right. And light is, a, is one of the major trigger of bulb initiation. So despite the, the application of constant nutrients, so if your water program is up, your nutrient program is up, only and may not trick, may not bulb if the daylight doesn't correspond with the variety, right? The other factors that will, will basically contribute to the temperature and your soil fertility. All right. So what happens is that as the as the as the daylight corresponds to the variety, the onion will basically shift the focus from vegetative growth to bulb development, right? And for persons who have planted varieties like Texas early Ghana in the spring, you realize that these varieties bulb earlier because they're designed for a short day length. An next factor, uh, skin or bulb color. So as I said before, you have different varieties that give you different colors. So you, have, you range from yellow, white, golden, purple, or red, right? And these are gauge or determined by the type of flavonoids present in an onion, right? So the flavonoids in a red and a purple onion will be different from a yellow onion or be additional to a yellow onion. All right, next factor, disease tolerance or resistance. And uh, with the season being wet so far and predictions even extending this wet season into January, uh, we have to look up we we'll have to consider that this as an important factor because as we, as I'm gonna discuss further on, diseases such as downy mildew, purple blotch can really wipe out a crop within a short time. So considering a variety that is either highly tolerant or resistant to most of the fungal diseases that I'm gonna mention. And finalize, finalize shape, right? Uh, this, this also depends on the market. So restaurant may require different shape onion based on ease of cutting or ease of use, and which may vary from a processor who has a specified implement that is basically processing the onion. So you have to understand the shape that you require or the market requires. And there you go, basically examples of different shape on the market. We have a globe, a flat window, etc. All right, so let's move on to methods of planting. And so uh, internationally, there are three methods of planting onion. As you can see, sets are basically immature onions that are usually uh, sold, in, sold in high volumes and then uh, harvested and packaged and sent to farmers to basically plant, right? So these are basically planted at specified distances. And over time, with the proper nutrition, water, you have these sets expanding and developing into bulbs. Like that. And this is not this is not a practice for for tropical regions, right? We prefer to use seeds or transplant, but this is common in areas such as Israel, uh, North America, and parts of Europe. And also for many backyard farmers in America, they would usually use sets, right? The next method would be direct seeding or seeds. This is basically one of the most common methods used in the Caribbean because easy to use and uh, more labor, less labor is required to basically use this method, right? Another, another, another method is transplant, which I'm gonna mention the positives and the negatives between this direct seeding 
and the transplant, since these are two of the methods used in the Caribbean. All right, so one of the first advantage of, of direct seeding. So as I said before, minimal labor, right? And with minimal labor, this process basically takes less time. So, so generally you would use like a hand seeder or you can use a mechanical seeder that will, will basically directly sow the seeds into the soil. So without the use, without the manual, manual application or without manual planting of the seeds by the farmer, the machine that you're using will basically directly, directly plant the seeds into the soil. All right, secondly, or thirdly, greater planting density, All right? So you can basically have more plants in an area as if you had transplanted, so you're getting greater density. And usually for different plants, as you can select the spacing that you require. And finally, lower cost to establish the field. So because you're using, in general, you use for a hand planter, you one man can operate it to minimize the cost. All right, so one of the negatives of direct seeding. Uh, the seeds are prone to damage by ants, right, and other insects. And for, for persons who would generally plant earlier in the fall season, the young plants are susceptible to heavy rainfall. So when you just sow your seeds, there's a possibility of having the seeds washed away after a heavy rainfall. All right, so let's focus now on transplants. All right, one of the first factors is that you know, the transplant allow you to basically have an extended weed control period. And what that means is while you are basically growing your seedlings, you can continue to control your weeds or basically uh, minimize the weed population, right? So you get an extended weed control period. And there's a, it's a greater possibility of using pre-emergent pre herbicides close to planting, all right? And the next positive is that uniform spacing. So generally, persons have a standard to tran do transplant. So depending on the size bulbs you're looking, you can space accordingly. And then now, uh, a positive is that you get larger bulbs. Based on the wider spacing, you generally get larger bulbs compared to direct seeding. And, and uh, finally, plants can basically withstand stress better compared to direct seeding. But the negatives of this process is that it's very labor intensive because the plant with an acre generally persons require about six to 10 persons if you want to complete the task within a uh, two to three day timeline. And with that ex uh, additional labor, so you're getting high labor costs, and it's so very time consuming, lower planting density, density, and requires a nursery setup. Either if your, your nursery is on a bed or on planting beds, or in a physical structure where doing it in trees, it requires a nursery space. All right, so based on that, let us basically go into the understanding of how the plant develops. So for, for persons who are basically new to onion planting, this will this depicts the different stages. So first stage you see the establishment, right? And we're talking about the early seedling stage, followed by vegetative growth, then bulb initiation, so the starting of bulbing by bulb development, right? And then to, top, to complete the process, you have maturity. And the timeline usually generally varies depending on your, on the area that you're located in. So in the tropics, you, you would have a quicker bulb development compared to in a more cooler climate, right? So the, the stage duration varies depending on your location. So based on, so from this understanding, you'll use, you see, uh, hear me use terms. So you can understand which phase I'm talking about or stage I'm talking about. All right, so let us go to onion requirements. 
All right, I want to first requirement, especially for farmers who are doing direct seeding, is basically a refined soil. So because you, because the seeds, the onion seeds are very small, you have to ensure that the era or planting bed is basically very refined, right? Because the rooting, the, the, in order to get quick rooting, the soil has to be loose to generate that quick root development. And soil temperature usually is about 15 to 25 degrees C. And another important point for having basically a well-refined bed is that if you're using a planter, uh, if there is any stone or clumps, that will basically affect the distribution of the seed. So if the planter reaches or approaches a stone, it might either not release any seed or release too, too much seed in that area. All right, our next key factor is pH. And for optimal plant growth, you know, onions require pH about between six and seven. And this is even essential for your, what, your water as well. So your soil pH and your water pH usually needs to be about six to seven. All right, salinity, which I, uh, which I continue to mention is a great factor, especially in the Caribbean and, and especially in areas that are low line and close to the sea, because onions are very susceptible to high sea line soil. Right? So that, and salinity is basically gauged by the level of sodium within your soil. So in areas that persons usually incorporate the fertilizers before planting, you have to be careful to not cause harm to your seeds, right? So basically scorching of the seeds may occur, may occur if the sea line level is very high. All right, and this slide is a short depiction of how sensitive, sensitive onions are to high sea line levels, right? So they're in the lower bracket, so very sensitive. As you can see, it's within the same range as bees. While, onion, while carrot and strawberry is below that. And so onions are very sensitive to high salinity. So getting a, a check of your water is very crucial to ensure the successful germination of your crop. All right, the next requirement, irrigation. And water is essential for the germination of onions, right? And during the crop, the requires about 350 to 550 millimeters of water to grow in cycle. So for the first for the first two to three months, the onion will basically demand most of the water requirement in that period. Up to bulk development, uh, the water application should be minimized, right? Do not cause any rotting of the bulk. Right? So usually irrigation is seized 15 to 25 days before harvest. And this will allow for the proper drying out of the bulb and get a better harvest. All right. And uh, this table is, would be very uh, essential for farmers who, are, who want to do soil tests and are considering the nutrient levels within the soil. And as you can see, for phosphorus, if, you're, if your phosphorus level range between zero to five parts per million, uh, that, that level will be considered deficient, right? But if it's uh, greater than 15, it's sufficient for the cultivation of onion. But for potassium, if a level is less than 40 parts per million, it's deficient. And if it's greater than 120 parts per million, it would be sufficient. And then you see zinc, and this, and this can be done for other crops, right? Focusing on a couple of the main macro and micronutrients for onion production. All right. Nitrogen and so the macronutrient requirement. All right. So for nitrogen, basically very essential nutrients, and onion usually require a total of 150 pounds per acre or 100. 170 kg of nitrogen per hectare. And what I'm talking about here, I'm talking about elemental nitrogen. 
So I'm not saying the onion requires 150 pounds pound bag of nitrogen or of sulfate of ammonia. I'm saying the onion requires for nitrogen itself 150 pounds. And to basically break that down, onion will require about about six, six to eight bags of sulfate of ammonia to, to get that 150 pounds of nitrogen. All right? All right. And at later date, we can basically go into the calculation of nutrients for your crop. But farmers note, the crop generally needs 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre. All right. And the nitrogen application will usually depend on several factors. So your soil type, uh, the amount of rainfall you're getting. And for soil type, I'm talking about, so if you're on a sandy soil, you, lo you lose most of your nitrogen quicker than if you're on a clay soil. Right? But rain, heavy rainfall, so if you're the area that you're getting heavy rainfall, like that your nitrogen is leached quicker and your irrigation pattern, right? So if you're, if you're applying irrigation constantly, that would also cause the leaching of your nitrogen. And plant population, which should always be considered for any crop that you're doing. So based on your plant population, that can be, be a gauge of how much nitrogen you should, you should apply. And then a method and time of application. So either you're working with your granular application, soluble application, or foliar. But usually we encourage that you either, along with your foliar application, you either do granular or soluble application. But your foliar application is generally a complement to your main source of nutrients. All right. The next element that is needed is phosphorus, right? And phosphorus is generally uh, needed prior to planting. And the reason being is that, no, phosphorus is generally applied prior to planting because it is essential for quick root development. So many times in our cultivation, we focus on that applying high nitrogen, but phosphorus is basically a key for quicker root development, which will later cause for the greater of right. Secondly, uh, also because phosphorus is basically needed on a lower level throughout the cropping cycle, it's generally recommended that you do a constant application are a constant application throughout the period. So from germination to bulb development, you do a constant application. However, because this nutrient is immobile and it can be picked up from the soil or generally lower leaves of the plant would transfer the phosphorus to the younger leaves, right? So the demand of phosphorus for onions is not as high as uh, macronutrients like potassium, which I'm gonna discuss next. And so potassium, as you can see, is very essential for the cell development process and also movement of water, right? So the, the nutrients that control movements of water across the cell wall and also key in energy reaction processes for the plant. So you will see on, on a graph following this where put high levels of potassium is required for onion production. And generally, uh, it is recommended that about 30 to 50% of the potassium can be applied pre-planting, right? So still considering your sodium level or your salinity, you, you can basically apply your, your potassium, 30, 30 to 50% of the potassium pre-planting, right? All right, so let's look at this graph of nutrient requirements, so both macronutrients and micronutrients. And as you can see, nitrogen, potassium, and calcium are needed in great, great amount, right? Uh, you can see, so the cumulative requirement, nitrogen, so we're averaging in about 140 pounds nitrogen and potassium, while calcium a little lower, about 120. So in addition to micronutrients such as manganese, copper, boron, and zinc. And to note, uh, although sulfur contribute 
to the flavor content or the pungency of onions. It's not generally needed in high amounts, right? You can basically apply about 60 pounds of nitrogen, of sorry, sulfur to the acre of land. So it's not needed in great, um, great amounts. And for other, other micronutrients like boron, basically a pound of micronutrient, elemental boron can be applied to the acre. We don't, use, we don't usually recommend that you exceed that because high levels of boron can be toxic to the crop. So we don't usually recommend applying more than that. Right? So these are basically some of the requirements that are needed for the onion nutrient demand. Right, so you can do further research on these, but these are some of the general information based on onion demand. All right, so next, what we do, we focus on some of the key aspects of onion production, right, which is the pest and disease management. All right, so the first one we see seen here is damping off. And damping off uh, is, is one of the most common fungal problems that nursery growers experience. And this can also affect the onion. So caused by a fungus pitium. And what you're usually having is that you know, seeds basically become water soaked or mushy. Or if it's re if it has reached a transplant stage, what you see happen is that you know, the section that is in contact with the soil will start to become narrow and wet, right? So the fungal pathogen basically targets the area that is in contact with the soil. And what we have at Agkem to control this problem is our topsin, which will be the active ingredient thiophanate metal, followed by carbendazim, which is a systemic fungicide that can be applied foliarly or through drench application. So either drenching with your spray pan or sending it through your fertigation system. And then now uh, thirdly, your acrobat, acrobat. It's effective product they are with two active ingredients. They're getting both a contact and a systemic product. And the contact aspect of the acrobat is your mancozeb, while the systemic aspect is your diametum oil. And the application rate for these products for topsin, five to 10 grams per gallon, carbendazim, five to 10 ml per gallon, while the acrobat can be applied from 15 to 20 grams per gallon. And to note, acrobat, can also be drenched or sent through your fertigation system. All right. Secondly, now is downy mildew. And with the wet period, downy mildew can be a major problem for a lot of onion farmers. So if you have a early crop going on, look out for downy mildew. And what you can see is these guys spots, spots starting to farm in the field. Sorry. What started to form on the foliage, right? Basically, these spots appear gray to purple. And what you have is that, you know, uh, closer to the, maturation, uh, the maturity of the fungus, you have the spores basically being transferred by wind or water, right? And then now, uh, with the development, pale, pale yellow lesions start to expand and cause the area that the lesion is present to collapse, right? So you start to see the foliage bent down, right? And, this, and solutions we have for that is our topsin, followed by the mancozeb, mancozeb is a contact fungicide, followed by your sulcox, which is also another contact fungicide, a copper-based fungicide, and your acrobat. And for mancozeb and the sulcox, you can use that five to 30 grams Per gallon. So this is one to two tablespoons per gallon. For botrytis now, uh, and generally farmers usually con confuse the appearance of bot botrytis for trips damage, right? But these are usually small lesions, small lesions with basically a green halo. But what happened as the as the, the pathogen basically or the fungal problem basically increases these lesions basically expand right unlike unlike the trips damage that was look like stipules 
on the leaf, the, the lesion will basically expand, right? With a light green halo, right? And our products of control is your topsin, your bellis, and your mancozeb. And bellis is a systemic fungicide with two active ingredients, boscalid and pyroclostrivin. And the application rate is eight to 16 grams per gallon. And the difference in the application rate is that when you use the bellis at eight grams, you're getting the fungicidal effect. When you increase the rate to 16 grams, you're getting fungicidal effect along with the oxalance effect. And the oxalance effect will basically encourage the plant to photosynthesize more, which will lead to greater yield. So not only fungicide effect, you're getting a uh, nutrient benefit as well. All right. And for farmers who are not, are not keen on how these pathogens look, the next slide will help you. You can see over there to the left, you have the damping off issue. And this can and this can affect both direct seed or transplant. In the middle, you have your stony mildew. And over to the right, you have botrytis. And I say botrytis sometimes appear like trips damage. All right, let's just move on. And as you can see on the slide here, the different fungicides. So this will basically give you a visual of how the fungicides look. So you have a top senior your man because they have a carbendazine. You can see the belly, since it's a large representation, you have the acrobat and the zampro. And I'm going to focus, and I'm going to talk about the zampro shortly. And because we're doing, or we're focusing on onion, which is a crop with a waxy leaf, you can't leave out your adjuvants. So adjuvants like a breakthrough, your exit, your newfound pea, and spread hospital. So both the breakthrough and exit will be, will be ideally ideal for your systemic fungicides, right? Or, or insecticides. And these are basically penetrants. So these allow the products to enter the plant foliage. But the new flame pea and your spread of are effective contact for contact insecticide or fungicide. And these will allow for greater wetting, greater sticking. And if in incidence of rain, high rainfall, is allow the products to be firmly held on the plant for a uh, greater control. All right, so the fungal disease. So we have the purple blotch. Basically, this will start with small water soak lesions, right, with a white center. And generally, this would have an eye shaped. So an uh, eye turned slant would basically give you the look of the purple blotch. But as the fungal Pathogen mature, the white center will basically turn purple, right? This is basically indicating the development of the spores. All right. And the control for this, your top skin, your belly, your mancozeb. Now, next issue, which usually appears similar to your purple blotch, is your stem phylum blight, right? Similar eye looking water soak lesion, but however, instead of basically appearing purple at maturity, the fungal pathogen or the lesion will basically turn black or remain black, right? So th this is how you can distinguish it from your purple blush. And usually these, uh, both purple blush and symphalin basically occur in your, your warmer period. So during the fall, fall season, you won't have much or if any incidence of purple blush. Usually from January going down, you have incidence of your purple blush. And your pseudomonas, the bacterial rats. So basically, you have water soak or green lesions starting on the leaf and generally uh, travel down to the neck region, which would eventually lead into the bud. So, causing, uh, as I say, water soak regions, generally soft and giving off an odor. And the control for this is your sulcox, which you can use at 30 grams per gallon. And uh, Solcox will be your, your most effective solution because, as I said before, it's a copper base. And for bacteria, for, for bacterial control, 
Huppelby, Hopper-based fungicides or bactericides are essential. As you can see, purple blotch, seeing that purple region, well, they have a stem file and blight. And over to the right, bulb rot or bacterial rot. All right. So moving from our fungal pathogens now, or diseases to our insect pests. Can you go, excuse me, can you go back one, please? Let me see the images. Thanks, that's it, yeah man, thanks. Okay. All right, so insect pests. Uh, I know ants, a lot of farmers generally have an issue with ants. And what these do is basically remove your seeds. So after sowing your seeds, the ants will remove them. Or if you basically transplant those young growing roots, the ants will basically feed on those to get um, of nutrients. And what we have as effective solution is our cabaret. So you can either dust the seeds with the camera or you basically drench or fertigate the area to be planted before direct seeding. Right? Or you can use the tropical insect powder, which you can dust the seed as well. And other solutions are a diacin and a caratrox, both, both of which you can drench or fertigate. These will give effective control. And secondly, your Spodoptera, Sigua, your beet army worm, which is, I think, is one of the, the most destructive pests we're experiencing in onion, well, followed by trips. But it's one of the most destructive pests we're experiencing. So control products we have, one of the key control products here, Indicar, a con contact insecticide, which will give effective control of your larvae and even your adults. And you can use it at a rate of five to 10 ml per gallon, right? And secondly, your Mimic, which is uh, a more safer product to use. And this product would encourage scouting. Reason being, this product has to be used when the larva is active or feeding. But what it does is a mold, is a molting hormone, right? So this would, would basically trick the worm that it would or it should enter the molting process. And right? so the worm has to be present on the plant before applying the mimic. I can use that a rate of five to ten ml per gallon. And to top it off, we have the caratrax, still effective. And usually I recommend that farmers or applicators properly gear up when using this product. And use it at a rate of 2.5 to 5 ml per gallon. All right. Thirdly, your leaf miner. And leaf miner basically is the larva, larva farm of the adult. And the adult basically would appear like a fly. Generally, you see some small fly, flies flying around the field. Uh, it could be the adult farm of your leaf miner. And what this insect test does is basically to feed in the inner layers of the plant. So it feeds between the upper layer and the lower layer of the foliage. And, can, and severe feeding can cause large lesions to be created in the foliage. So you want to con, uh, effectively control the leaf miner. And options are, you have a cabaret, you have a caprid, which is both a contact and systemic insecticide. You have a very effective systemic insecticide, dimetoid, very effective. And you have a contact insecticide, cure, right? And there are the different application rates. All right. And finally, final piece of focus right today is your trips. And believe me, farmers, we have to take better approach in controlling our trips because this test is becoming uh, very, very, very important in the crop going forward because the damages that this test creates is great. So what you, what you will basically see happening is that some small, minute insects feeding in the inner layers of the plant. And generally, the trips usually come on about the two months period. So two months after feeding, you'll see the trips feeding in the, in the inner leaves. And reason being, the foliage is now thicker and they have a greater shelter, right? 
And what they'll do is basically scrape the foliage, the foliage to create stipples on the leaf, right? And this will basically cause a retardation of the leaf growth. So generally, you see the leaf start to bend and look in the form. And if the population is high, this will even amper your bulb development, right? So because the foliage is really damaged, the plant is not able to focus on bulb development, but instead of trying to uh, to grow out the malformity has been occurred. All right, and the solution for the trips, we have a caprid, followed by a diameter weight, your definite, your cabaret, and your indicar. So those are the solutions for your trips control. And remember, do not leave out your adjuvants. So either your exit, your breakthrough, your new FIMPI, or your predecessor. All right, and those are pictures of the pets. They're in a beta worm and can be identified by that line running across the body, that distinct line. While your leaf miner, if you closely look in those uh, affected areas, you see small black insects, sometimes brown, it's called feeding within that area. And then now finally, your trips, a very minute pest, so you have to basically look within the leaf, the foliage, the plant to identify them. And if, if you're not seeing the pest physically, you will see those stipples being created or scrapings on the leaf. And the insecticides that we have, I'm sure we have a picture of them. So you have the cure in the carb, and we have them in different skew sizes, our different skews. Your car barrel, your car trucks with that, man. Mimic a definite, right? All right? And let us basically go now to the one of the most important aspects of the presentation or for onion production, the cropping program. All right. And this will basically take you from the ballpark of getting your 18,000 pounds or 20,000 pounds per acre to your now 45,000 pounds per acre. All right. And let me go through them then. So, Usually I recommend that the foliar application begins at week three. And we generally start with our solid growth, which is a high phosphorus fertilizer with micronutrient. And what this does is basically encourage quick rooting and supply the newly generated roots with a lot of phosphorus, which I've mentioned before, is very effective in your in root development. And what will combine the solid growth is your Miller cytokine. And the cytokine will stimulate root development, shoot development, right? And cell uh, elongation. So in the, with combining the solid growth with cytokine, you basically have a great, great uh, synergistic uh, effect. So stimulating a root while the solid growth is basically feeding the new roots with the high levels of phosphorus. And then to complement that, that application is your green stem, a stress reliever. Uh, you have issues where rainfall might be high or the heat, heat or the over temperature above the plant might be great. So combining or adding green stem to your program is very effective. Because one of the key ingredients in the green stem is called betaine, which are, which are found to be effective in minimizing plant stress. Right? So that is a key advantage of the green stem. And in the rotation, your fourth week of application, your foliar, and, and to note, viewers, these are foliar products. I'm talking about foliar application now. So in your fourth week of application, you're looking to use your omics bio 20. Right? And this is a, a biostimulant foremost. So a biostimulant with 2020 properties. And the key thing about this bio 20 is that it has 28% seaweed extract. So 28% of kelp. And what the kelp does is that it encourages quicker rooting and faster rooting. So unlike many 2020 fertilizers that usually cause scorching to the new roots, this, this 2020 solution will basically 
give you quicker root development, faster rooting to get the plants out. And with the other micronutrients, you're getting greater foliage development for basically leading into your two months of growth. And then a uh, complement to that is your omics fortify. And the beautiful thing about the fortify, which I encourage farmers to always include in their rotation once you're doing your omics application, is that the fortify will help to bring around your fungicides much faster because the ingredients of phosphate and phosphite, with the phosphite basically binding to your fungicide and bringing bringing around it fast through the plant, will basically boost the immunity of your plant. And the phosphate will help with the movements of nutrients. Right? And for your fifth week of application now, you're returning back to your solid growth because you're still in the root development stage. You're returning with a solid growth, high phosphorus, foliar again, as I said before, but you're using it at a rate of 10 gram per gallon while the increase in the rate of your cytokine now to 10 ml per gallon, followed by a green stim. So it's still boosting root development within the first six weeks. All right, so six week of application, omix bio 20, increasing now the application rate to 15 ml per gallon. So we're basically finalizing the root development now, looking now to basically control any uh, issues with your calcium deficiency. And they usually see calcium deficiency through your tick burn. But your product of product of choice to minimize that is your Calmax B. Right? Calmax B, cal calcium based product with about 22% weight by volume calcium, with 1% boron, followed by your micronutrients such as your magnesium, your manganese, zinc, etc. So this is very it's an effective product in basically minimizing your tick burn. Right, let's go to week seven now. Oh, and these are these are your different products. So you buy a 20 there, and the one liter skew, fortify, followed by your kickstart or your solid glue. All right, week seven now. So what we're doing now is basically encouraging high or greater foliage development. So we're coming now with a neutral leaf here, 2020-20 with micronutrients. And this will also encourage root development, foliage development, supply the plants with micronutrients. And then in addition to uh, your neutral leaf, come now with your site again and your green stem. And because we're still within the first two months of growth, we're looking to increase in or getting quick foliage development. So the cytokine is ideal in that. And green stem now, because the plant may still be observing stress, we include that to mini minimize the stress the plant may experience. And we use those at 10 ml and 10 gram per gallon. All right, week eight, return with our Bio 20, Fortify and Calmax D combination. Because within this stage, onion is, the, is a crop that uh, uses, as we can see, a lot of calcium and nitrogen. So what we do, come with the, combina the omics combination to supply with nitrogen and phosphorus with the bio 20, uh, boosting immunity with the fortify, and then on the Calmax B to supply that added calcium to minimize any tick burn or any, or any uh, micronutrient deficiency. Ninth week application. So we'll shift from the neutral leaf to the nutrient express. And as you can see, the combination of 441 27. All right, so high phosphorus product that is basically equipped with a lot of micronutrients. So this will basically give you a quick source of nutrients because 15 minutes of application, 15 minutes of application, the plant, the plant will basically be using the nutrients from nutrient express. And as again, we come with the cytokine and green stem. So we're still encouraging foliage development. And you may be asking why I'm pushing the cytokine and green stem so much in the program. All right. Uh, onion is basically, or the bulb size is determined by the number of leaves, right? So the more foliage you have, the greater the bulb size. Right? Because each, each leaf that you see growing up, 
will determine the amount of scales or the size of your bud. So I'm so pushing the foliage development. And for week 10 now, what we do, because we have basically out of a two months period now, we're thinking now to generate mainly bulb development. So we're trying to, despite the plant uh, being, being gauged by light, we're, we're also using nutrient to kind of assist the plant in shifting from foliage development into bulb development. So we take out our bio 20 and focus on our 45 Calmax D. We use those at 15 ml per gallon. And these are the products. Calmax D, a green stem inside it. All right, let's go in now into week 11. So we're looking at using our nutrient express, as I said before, a high phosphorus product with micronutrients in combination with our ZMC express. And ZMC express may be new to a lot of farmers. However, this is our micronutrient complement from Miller. As you can see, it has a combination of zinc, magnesium, and calcium. So any micronutrient deficiency being experienced by the plant, let them see we control that. All right, and for week 12 now, still focusing on our 45 Calmax D, because with greater foliage, we might have incidence of fungal diseases. So we we'll still have to include our 45 to boost immunity, followed by our Calmax D, because we're going to have greater bulb development now, or the starting of our bulb initiation, which will demand a lot of calcium. So we'll still include, in, still include our Calmax D, supply that. Uh, week 30 you now, focusing on Nutrient Express, again, the green stem. And because we are now, we are now into our bulb development, kind of ease off the cytokine, so that we basically don't have too much, don't have the plant going back in generating new leaf and taking away from the bulb that we're, we're developing. But because the plant may be encountering stress, we still include our green stem. Minimize the stress and encourage greater growth. Followed by week 14 again, omix fortify with our Calmax D. And then now to finish off the process, because we're looking for greater weight and size from our balls, we include our sugar express, a high potassium product, right? And based on the graph that we see, the plant requires a greater volume of potassium. So sugar express is great for that. So 15 minutes after spraying on the product, the potassium will be basically will be moving from the plant to the to, from the foliage to the bulb, and to complement the process, because when you're adding on excess potassium, what will happen is that you know, you'd have greater bulb development, but the, but this may cause you know, cracking or splitting of the bulb, right? So what we do, we include our Calmax B to minimize any potential of splitting of the bulb, right? The climax is supply the calcium. So as the bulb is expanding in size, the tissue is also expanding as well. And there, there is a look at the product that we have on this. We have the Nutrient Express and our Sugar Express, and you can see 4, 10, 40, 40% 40 potassium, so high phosphorus, high potassium product. Then you have your ZMC, micronutrient complement. And from this program, I'll basically show you some of the successes our farmers have reaped success so far. Right? And, and there are more farmers up there, uh, out there. Right? Some farmers are camera shy, but these are farmers so ranging from St. Thomas, St. Catherine, Manchester, Clarendon. You have numerous farmers that have reaped success from the Agchem program. So what we're talking about, we're talking about the uh, fungicide, insecticide, the biostimulant, and fuller fertilizers. All right. And to give you an understanding of the financial, because remember in the first presentation, I told you that getting a cost-benefit analysis is crucial, right? So let me show you our working out from this program. So for our area, measuring about 0.4 hectare, which is equivalent to an acre. 
all right? And uh, crop maturity about three and a half to four months. And generally what I'm seeing with the Agim program, we're getting the crop to mature in three and a half months, right? And it could be earlier, depending on uh, your inclusion, the amount of macronutrients. With the plant density now, of over 700,000 plants, right? The space in our five by five centimeters, and this generally relates to direct seeding. So for transplant, the space is usually wider, right? And as I say you'd have less plant density. All right. So uh, although this figure is not is not basically static, which may change depending on era. All right. So for land preparation. Oh no, average cost will be 35,000 for irrigation for the period, 20,000, granular fertilizer, 50,000. And uh, viewers, remember, as said, uh, do not calculate your fertilizer based on bugs, but calculate it, calculate it based on elemental need. So you're not calculating your fertilizer based on bugs, but elemental need, right? In labor, Average 50,000, which may vary, as I said. Uh, pesticides, so your fungicides and insecticides, about 55,000. While the foliar, fertilizing, and biostimulants coming out at 40,000. So, with this calculation, the total expense would be 250,000. And for persons who might ask me, what about your irrigation setup? So, your buying your pipes and all that, I didn't consider that in this calculation because usually those are capital expense. So cost of that will work out over time, right? All right. So with the marketable yield being 45,000 pounds for the farmers on the flat, and you, you see where I minimize it for the farmers who are not on the hillside. And the reason being, a lot of times, uh, you have a lot of leaching and nutrients. So that was a consideration into minimizing it. But for farmers on the flat, we're still holding the figure of 45,000 45, pounds per acre. All right, and based on that calculation at a, at a market price of $70 per pound, we're looking at a whopping $3.1 million. You might say, Janai, that, that seemed like a, a, a jumbled up figure out of some fairy tale story, right? No, this is basically a potential of what you can earn from the onion crop. And for a person on the hillside, you're seeing 2.5 million. And when I basically subtract the expense, we're looking at a profit of, for the farmers on the flat, 2.9 million. And for the farmers on the hillside, 2.2 million. Right. And this may, may even, this Excuse is me, Jenna. Uh, hello? Yes, does this cost involves any weeding or your pesticides cover all that requirement in terms of weed management? All right, for weed management, based on the land preparation training, I've basically calculated weed management as a low cost for this cost benefit analysis because you'll be using your field bed technique or your pre emergent herbicide. So I'm not, I'm not considering a field that is riddled or covered with weed, right? Because to get this, to get this pownage, you have, you have to start with a field with minimal to no weeds, right? To get that. So I'm not saying, I'm not, I didn't factor the labor cost based on, based on mainly manual weeding, right? Understand? I know, I know for persons who generally have a high weed population in their field, the labor cost is usually very high, right? And sometimes run, run about 50% of the cost. But for this program, we are working with a relatively clean field. There might be instances where you may need labor to pick out a couple of weeds or apply a pre-emergent, but we're considering a field with minimal weeds. I understand, I understand that, on a general, but normally that land preparation and pre-emergence upfront lasts for about six weeks. What about the, rem the remainder of the crop life? All right, you see, uh, with proper use of your pre emergent, you know, uh, the, the control can even last longer because if you're, if you're pre 
pre prep activity can give you six weeks, six to eight weeks, right? When you come in with a product such as benzene, that can basically control your weed seed and give you greater control to the end of your crop. So there are, there are farmers out there who can tell you that when they're harvesting, they just have a couple of weeds coming up. So what 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 all right, what I'm trying to say is that you know we are basically getting out of our mind that we'll have much weed problem throughout the crop because with our proper practice, we will have basically a weed free field throughout the cropping cycle. And, 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 and I'm well aware of weed being a major challenge. And that's why I focus on proper land or proper land preparation followed by weed control. Because once you have weeds, you're basically losing all your 50,000 worth of fertilizer to the weeds and some to the plants. Sorry, just one more question before you go. Um, you mentioned about the post-emergence to the crop. You mentioned uh, herbicide. I think you said benzene. Yeah. Okay, I was just want to get that name. I probably missed a that part. It's a pre-emergent herbicide that can be applied over the crop. Over the crop. Yeah, once you apply it about 60 days before harvest, you won't have any issue. Uh, uh, okay. I don't remember if I have a six, see that one before. Uh, all right. Okay. All right. So, farmers, uh, I'm going to discuss it from on part of I came, you know, what we're trying to do is basically encourage encourage uh, communication between the team and on their farmers. So following this presentation, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a question. And this question is will basically result in a farmer walking away with product omics bio 20. Right. And you can use either the raisin feature or your comment in the box. Mr. Box. So the question is what name a key insecticide from Akim in the control of beet armyworm. I repeat, name a key or name an Akim solution in the control of beet armyworm. Gilmore Dixon's and this one. Yes, sir, Dixon. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Go ahead, Good sir, afternoon. Yes, Is it afternoon. mimic? Yeah. All yeah, right. The use of mimic. Yes, mimic is one one of the, one of those solutions, right? And and the other solutions are Indicav and Caratrax. Yes, uh, you're right, sir. Uh, they can stay on stay online and basically or pass on information in a message box to or to Mrs. Robinson. All right. Okay then. All right. Thanks. And farmers, uh, for who our persons or experience are new to the plant of onion, you can contact our reps. We have Dale Smith in the Northwest region, followed by Sian and Spence in the Southeast region. And then you have in the Central area, Dean Parker, and yours truly, John I. Johnson in the, south, in the Southeast region. And then in the Northeast region, you have Mr. Dennis Lecky. So you can control, you can contact your different reps regarding any information on your onion crop care. And what we're going to basically distribute weekly guides. So either on your social media platform or physical copies. And you can join me Friday, November 27th at 3.30 on Facebook, on Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram. And I'll basically go through the onion crop care guys so anything you miss you can join me there and you can you basically get an understanding of the complete guide and upcoming events there's a zoom training next week tuesday and that will be on the potato we're going to feature the dip so i came dip and in addition to weed weed control and weevil control and that's next week tuesday same time, 1 p.m. With your presenter, Sian Spence, I said, for the development agronomist for your southwest region. 
But at this time, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and ask. Hey, Janai. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I think. I, I think. Um. <clears throat> how, how come say you know, I went to um at the granular fertilizer because I know that that is needed to support the the full layer um application that they're using. All right. Yeah. All right. Good question. Yeah. I didn't feature much based on the timing on the granular application, but for nitrogen, you can for nitrogen based ready, you can apply about twenty five percent. Prior to planting, right? And the remainder you apply uh, before bulb development. So we're talking about you now you're basically your one month into growing. So four to six weeks into growing, you can apply the rest of your nitrogen. As for phosphorus, most of your phosphorus application can be done prior to planting, which which you want to encourage most of the root development. So the phosphorus application can be done prior to planting or at your four to six week stage. You understand? And as, as I mentioned, phosphorus is basically uh, constant within the soil and even your older leaves would be send phosphorus to the younger leaves. So it's a constant nutrient within the soil. And for your potassium now, that can be about 30% can be applied prior to planting and the remainder applied at your eight week stage, so right before your bulb initiation. Understand? And and that that uh, and those will vary for your solubles, which you may have to apply closer to the timing because it's in you know, a soluble form. Yeah. That answers the question. Yeah, man, copy that. All right. But as I say, at, uh, probably we'll have, we need to have, have a training on fertilizer application and even the mixing of pesticides. So that, that, that could be an next training for future events because the calculation of, of your fertilizer is, is a topic within itself. So that, that, that would be too time consuming for this training. All right. So we'll have to have that on the agenda. For an extreme. Right. Any more questions? Um, yes, I know. If it's right here again. Yes, it's right here. Will, will, they, these, will these recordings be available to, to the farmers to listen afterward? Yes, yes. We usually post recordings on, on YouTube or the other medium. Yeah. But this one will it, be available. Oh, is the first one post already? Yes, 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 they're they're both on um YouTube. Okay, all right. Any more questions? I have a, have a question. Who? Is that have a hand up? Is that Samuel? Yes, Susan, go ahead. Who's that? Um, Janoy. Yeah. What I realize is that some persons answered in the chat. Okay, some persons okay. answered in the chat before Mr. Gilmore. So we will, I'm trying to get their information. Mentors in her and to them, and also more. And all of us are looking at the 